welcome everyone to the Institute of Commonwealth Studies virtual event. It's the second of events, a series of events which I've organized really to flag up some of the digital resources that we make available in this time when uh, it's not possible to use libraries as we, as we normally do uh, or get into, get into archives. These digital resources are more important than, than ever. And um, for the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, one of our most important research projects over the last decades was the British Documents on the End of Empire series, um, which ran from uh, 1987 till the, the mid 2000s. And about five years ago, we made almost all of the volumes available in digital form. We've, we've finally sort of completed the set. And um, uh, with David Goldsworthy's uh, volume on the Conservative governments from 1951 uh, to 57. And I'm going to start by taking you through the website for those not familiar with the, with the project. And, uh, uh, and then um, four of the uh, former editors, five including me, and uh, Dr. Mandy Banton are going to talk a little bit about our own experiences uh, working on the series. And then at the end, we'll be available to answer your questions. So please, in the, in the meantime, uh, by all means, leave your videos on. Uh, but if you're not uh, speaking, then please uh, mute yourselves. Um, use the chat function to, um, to add questions. Um, and I'll take those questions at the end. I'll sort of round them up. I might, if people would like to, to speak on camera and, and speak directly to the, uh, um, the speakers, then you'll be able to do that, just say so in the, in the chat at, at the end. Uh, and so we'll, we'll try and keep at least half an hour or so for, for questions from, from the floor. Um, let me begin by, by sharing my screen and just introducing the, the BD website. Um, so that's, you'll see uh, very simple, bdeep.org, but it's part of the website of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. Um, in the, uh, the sort of the home menu, we give uh, a little bit of information uh, about the, the series itself, um, uh, about when it was established, how it was established, so you can see here, uh, established in uh, 1987 under the auspices of the British Academy, based since its inception in the Institute of Commonwealth Studies at the School of Advanced Study. Its second, second tranche of volumes was uh, financed by the AHRC. Uh, you can see in the site index here, um, the way in which the series was arranged. So one has a series of general volumes uh, running from 1925 uh, to 1945. Uh, the first one, uh, second one, 45-51, third 51-57, 57-64, and then 64-71. There are then the uh, Series B country volumes, so Ghana, Sri Lanka, uh, Malaya, Egypt and the Middle East, uh, the Sudan, the West Indies, Nigeria, Malaysia, Central Africa, Fiji and Malta. And um, two sets of uh, general guides to the records, 
So the, the first one, um, looking at the records of the Colonial Office, the Dominion Office, Commonwealth Relations Office, Commonwealth Office. Um, the second, uh, looking at cabinet, rec cabinet Office records, Foreign Office, Treasury and other records, and both, both series, I mean, both sets of volumes edited by Anne Thurston. Um, and if you click on those uh, entries, take Ghana, for example, uh, on the, the website, you'll be taken to a homepage with a little background in introduction, uh, some biographical details about the editor, short description of the volume itself, and then depending on how many individual parts the volumes have, you click on those. And what you'll be brought to are the sort of the simple digitized hard copy volumes. And so the, the documents themselves, you'll see in this form pretty, pretty standard. This is for my Central Africa volume. Uh, so the National Archives uh, reference a brief description, maybe some editorial work, and uh, often some notes uh, explaining uh, the, the nature of the individual uh, who's write, writing them. Um, okay, uh, going back to the website itself, alongside the volumes themselves, uh, we kind of slowly adding other resources. There's um, in multimedia, uh, we have, for example, um, a recording of William Wadger Louis's lecture at the Institute in 2015, talking about the volumes in relation to the subsequent release of the so-called migrated archives, the Hanslow Park papers. And we might want to kind of go back and pick up on those. Um, but that is, the, that is the basic website. So the volumes themselves produced in hard copy form up until the mid 2000s. Then this website, which my then colleague Chris Moffat uh, put together in 2015. Um, and at that point, we were able to digitize all of the uh, volumes except one set, which was the set edited by David Goldsworthy. And that was because um, we simply couldn't uh, track David down um, to get the necessary copyright permissions. And it subsequently emerged that um, sadly David had, had died, um, which was uh, a great sadness, I mean, to, to all of us who, who knew him. He was very kind to me uh, at an earlier stage in my career and very encouraging when I was working as, as one of the, the editors. So uh, we've now put that, that volume up, um, but um, uh, just wanted to mention David in, in, uh, in that context. And also perhaps mention Martin Lynn, who's the other editor of uh, volumes here. Martin edited the Nigeria volume, um, who's no longer with us. And I think we, we have very fond memories of working with, with Martin um, and a, a wonderful seminar, which Martin arranged in Belfast. Sarah and I were both, were both uh, Richard was there as well, weren't you? Um, uh, a number of years ago, from which a, a volume emerged on colonial policy in Africa in the 1950s, which we, we contributed to. So um, those, are the, those are the volumes. Um, I want now to introduce our panel uh, and some of the editors of those volumes. So, um, Firstly, uh, Professor Sarah Stockwell, uh, who is Professor of Imperial and Commonwealth History at uh, King's College London, 
who edited the, the first in the chronological series of general volumes, the volume uh, covering the period from 1925 to 1945, which Sarah co-edited with Steve Ashton, who was the final general editor of the, uh, of the series. Um, Professor Tony Stockwell, AJ Stockwell, no relation, um, who uh, was Professor of Imperial and Commonwealth History at Royal Holloway, and actually edited volumes in, in both of the two separate phases of BD. So Tony edited the uh, Malaya volume, uh, which went up to independence in 1957, but also edited the subsequent Malaysia uh, volume, looking at the period after that, uh, up until 1963. Uh, we have uh, Professor Richard Rathbone, who was Professor of African History at SOAS and um, uh, edited the Ghana volume of the uh, B series. Um, professor David Killingray, who was Emeritus Professor of Modern History at Goldsmiths and who edited the West Indies volume, again, along with Steve Ashton. Um, I, um, my name is Philip Murphy, I'm director of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, and I edited the Central Africa volume in the series, which was part of the second tranche of country volumes. And, and acting as a kind of our, our sort of spirit guide for um, all things National Archives uh, uh, throughout this project was Dr. Mandy Banton who's former principal record specialist in diplomatic and colonial records at uh, the National Archives, who's very much in, involved as, a, as one of the people overseeing this process. I should just say before I ask um, uh, Sarah just to, to make some introductory remarks and now I'll sort of take the speakers in, uh, in order. Um, just a, again, a little bit about the institutional architecture of, of BD. Uh, it was supervised by a project committee, the first chair of which was Anthony Lowe. Uh, uh, Anthony's successor was Andrew Porter, who oversaw the, the final phase and the application to the HRC for the, the second tranche of, of money. The first general editor was Michael Crowder. Um, Michael Crowder was uh, succeeded by David Murray. Uh, and David Murray, although by the time I edited the Central Africa volume, had ceased to be uh, general editor. David was tremendously helpful to me uh, doing the, the kind of the proofreading that really sort of, you know, a really fine eye for that. And, and that was absolutely invaluable. So David remained uh, involved in the project. Uh, and the final general editor was, was Steve Ashton. Um, so that's, that's a kind of an overview of the, the project. Perhaps the, the, the final thing to say, and, and something which is crucial to understanding BD, is that it was not an official history. So the editors didn't have privileged access to uh, documents. We, we had pretty much the standard rights as, as an ordinary reader in, in the National Archives. Um, and so the issue of what was available when we were working, how that has changed, what recent releases might add to the, the sorts of materials that we were we were publishing is something that we might want to, um, to discuss. So I'm going to ask uh, our, our panelists just to sort of say a few introductory remarks about their volume of volumes. And then I'm going to uh, chair a discussion between the panelists and then take questions. So Sarah, thank you for joining us. And um, thank you very much, Philip. And thanks for organising this. And 
I think my perspective is twofold. One, having worked on the project, but more recently making very extensive use of the volumes, not just for my own work, but as an invaluable teaching resource, particularly uh, this year, um, and for uh, students working on dissertations. Um, I don't really feel I should be going first because my labours on this project were somewhat less than uh, Philip's, Richard's, uh, Tony's and David's, um, because I came into this uh, when those who were originally appointed as editors were unable to, to work on it. And I, I worked in conjunction, as Philip has said, with Steve Ashton. Um, it's my recollection that Steve basically worked on volume one and I worked on volume two. Our, our volume is in two parts. In Badeep terminology, a volume is each set um, and each set has different parts to it. And my volume has two parts. Um, and uh, it's a shame that Steve isn't here because Steve's role was, uh, was hugely important. Um, these general volumes are a different beast to the country volumes and my particular set were different to the other general volumes. Um, they were conceived very much as a prelude to the series as a whole. And uh, the period, as, as Philip said a few minutes ago, um, 1925 to 1945, that meant that these volumes are the, uh, not just of broad geographical scope as the other general volumes in the series are, but also of the broadest chronological span. Um, and that did mean that uh, sort of hard decisions had to be taken as to what was to be included. And there's a trade-off between sort of trying to be fairly comprehensive of all the issues that were preoccupying um, the British government in relation to imperial and colonial affairs in this era versus trying to tell a coherent story. And we tried to strike a balance between those two things and to cast our net wide um, so that there are documents in these volumes, these parts of this volume, um, on everything from uh, defence, international relations, sort of the Commonwealth, um, through to economics and social policy. Uh, but at the same time, there's a concentration on Africa and the Caribbean. Um, and also on the war years, as opposed to the, uh, the 25 to, to 39. Um, I think looking back, uh, you know, inevitably, there are some areas that I wish had been given greater prominence in the volume um, than we did. And I think that partly reflects, I mean, inevitably, you approach these with your own preoccupations. Um, but also because this volume was so broad in scope, uh, there was a sort of balance between being led by some issues that uh, were prominent in the historiography, whilst also being able to sample a whole range of, um, uh, of files. And actually, although Philip, as you said, it was not an official project, one of my very happy memories of working on Badeep was being able to go behind the scenes and pull um, boxes off the shelves. And it's something that I've wished I could do ever since, but it was a very happy moment of working in the National Archives to be able to do that. And the chance to quite quickly to see what was of interest in, in some. So I regret, for instance, that there's not more on science and the environment in, um, in this uh, prelude volume. On the other hand, um, I think uh, like other um, volumes in the, the series, it's rich in quite a variety of material. And there are some subjects there which still to some degree lie below a sort of scholarly radar. Um, and I think there are rich pickings to be had for people. So, you know, amongst, I, I flipped through it in advance of this and you know, amongst the issues that are there that, you know, maybe still don't really register very much. The discussions in 1941 about whether there should be colonial representatives sitting in the British Parliament, um, discussions about the lack of public understanding of the empire, quite extensive documentation on education policy. And I suppose um, uh, above all, and you know, what I'd pick out from this and from the other volumes is the account that they offer of the colonial office especially. I mean, these are unashamedly about British um, documents on the end of empire. And within that it's, it's Whitehall, um, the title, you know, end of empire, <laughs> the, these volumes, uh, generally, they don't take the story beyond um, independence. I mean, that's not relevant to mine, but, um, but within that uh, very British focus, there is 
real merit and I think it's still extraordinary unless I'm forgetting something that there is no history of the colonial office uh, except by Sir Charles Jeffrey as an insider. I know we sort of have books that come close to it, you know, accounts of the colonial service or uh, biographies of Secretary of States like Philip's excellent biography of Lennox Boyd um, or work like Joseph Hodges on, on science and expertise and the colonial office in the period that um, this volume um, covered. But in the absence of a scholarly history of the colonial office, uh, I do think these volumes are invaluable for what they, uh, they offer in that um, in particular. Um, and also the other theme I wanted to pick out is that although these are British um, and it's very much about British, I'm always surprised by how much material there is uh, that relates to the theme of connected histories of decolonization and the degree to which you have significant tranches of documents uh, running through um, different volumes in the series that uh, show how either uh, there were discussions taking place, you know, Anglo-French discussions, or there are British uh, reflections on French colonial practice um, and, uh, and the like. Um, so, uh, yes, as Philip, as you said, um, there's a whole question about the migrated archives. I won't speak about that because I think I've probably now spoken for long enough. So I shall, I shall stop there and hand over to the others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. That's, that's really helpful. Uh, Tony, can I turn to you and your your two volumes in this uh, in this project? Thank you, Philip. Um, I can't see myself. I don't know whether others. I can. You can. We can see you. Yeah, that's fine. Good, uh, fine. Good. Thank you very much. When I was um, preparing for this this wonderful occasion, my mind, my my memory went back as to 1985. I think it was and to a seminar which uh, Ralph Smith organized, a day seminar Ralph Smith organized at the India Office Library to commemorate, to celebrate um, the transfer of power, um, the, 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 uh, the Tinker volumes on the, um, the struggle for independence in, in Burma. The struggle it was so far as Tinker was concerned and the, uh, uh, the, the last of the Mansurg volumes on the transfer of power, very Whiggish, that um, the, uh, the, the end of the, the, the India volumes, which both of which uh, were and are um, official histories. And we've touched on this already. And of course, there are, there are huge advantages and, and there are disadvantages as well. In, in official histories. But one ad great advantage that both of those enterprises had was the, uh, the number of pages that they could occupy. And I think uh, the Mansurg transfer of power, which let's remember simply runs from uh, the Crips offer in 42 through to August, 1947, uh, occupies 12 substantial books. Um, Tinker felt, I think, rather hard done by um, for just being confined to two, but two very large, large books that ran from 1942 to, um, to, to uh, Burma's independence in 48. Um, and uh, whereas, of course, all along, and I think right from the start of this uh, enterprise, those who were appointed to, to any, whether it was a general volume or a country volume, were constantly counting up the number of pages they had and how many documents they could fit in, and whether it would be better to put this rather snappy document in and have done with it, or be perhaps more magisterial and waste 12 pages by being magisterial. And these, I think, were some of the, the constraints, quite apart from the financing of the, 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 the project, the, the, the constraints really of how many pages will we have, how many words will we get on a page, and uh, without um, losing the thread of battle. And the, 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 the uh, uh, seminar that I uh, attended way back in the, in, in the autumn of 1985 to celebrate TOP, transfer of power, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, struggle for the struggle for independence for Burma and Topi 
at the India office was also, I think, um, thanks to Ralph Smith's uh, 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 urging, uh, was also looking to ahead to possibly establishing a yet another volume, which would not be um, a, uh, an official volume, but something in Southeast Asia, which would perhaps round up or finish off the great presence from India, Burma, and maybe Malaysia and beyond. That didn't happen because Anthony Lowe already had an idea in his bonnet. And I think we all met, or some of us met, uh, at uh, Churchill College in May 1986, could it have been? when we came, came away full of elation. Though Andrew Porter and I, we came away, we said, I can, we, we both in a way looked at each other and said, I can't think what the, problem, what, what the, problem, what, what, what the advantage of this, this idea of documents. Uh, we're just about to produce a two volume work uh, on uh, documents on decolonization edited by uh, Porter and Stockwell. Can't we just stop it at there? Well, that was, I think, a very different kettle of fish and a kettle of fish designed for an undergraduate course. Um, so Malaya, um, I had the privilege of being designated for Malaya, and I had also the luxury of having a three-parter there before Malaysia came over the horizon. And Malaya was neatly, I think, uh, divided into three parts. One was wartime planning for the... Um, the, 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 the reoccupation of Malaya, it starts really in March. The first our document is March 1942, shortly after the fall of Singapore, when um, um, uh, an official in the, in, the, in the colonial office says, and I may if I may quote, the time has come when it seems opportune to raise the origin, to, to proceed, to raise the origin and scope of the criteria for colonial policy once the war is over. And I suppose that flagged up uh, the new thinking, the new age, uh, an opportunity in many respects to struggle free from uh, all the constraints of the interwar years uh, when sultans had to be balanced against a migrant community and so on and so forth and plan for a new deal. And that first book deals really uh, with the, the wartime plans for a post-war Malaya. And it ends really when those, for those plans collapse uh, very soon after Britain's reoccupation of Malaya and Singapore uh, in 1945-46. The second volume, the second book, um, is The Insurgency, The Insurrection, The Communist Insurrection. Um, and that uh, occupies um, the, really from the summer of 1948 right the way through to 1952. And the final book deals with planning for the, uh, the Alliance Road, the attempt really of a mul at a multiracial uh, uh, multi uh, um, solution to uh, independence, which uh, uh, um, is uh, put in place in 1957. Uh, one anecdote, if I might add, when the Malayan volume, Malaysian volume came out, we all said, what a pity it is that Chin Peng, who is the star really the, of uh, the 1948 volume, uh, the, second, the second book, so what a pity it is that we don't know where Chin Peng is, because we think we see he's still alive. And almost um, there was a knock at the door and Chin Peng appeared. And his appearance, he'd been, he'd fled after uh, the abortive attempt to uh, um, reach a, 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 an agreement with the British and the Alliance, Malay Alliance Party. He'd uh, fled into, into Thailand, and then he'd spent much of his time either in Southern Thailand or in China. And um, he came back to England when um, the end of empire episode of um, on, was being going to be broadcast. Robert Lemkin brought him back to England and um, he appeared at the Royal Holloway and Bedford Central London Retreat and Bedford Square. And we had a rather hush-hush um, hush, hush, semin seminar. And 
Um, Robert Lemkin, who is one of the producers, said, don't mention it because there'll be a lot of uh, ex-national service men who will lynch him. Uh, nobody, no, none of that at all. And in fact, after he'd spoken with us and his grasp of the detail, it was extraordinary, um, of the detail of what had been going on was absolutely immaculate. Um, there was no, there was no hoodlums outside the, the building at all. And then he went on from our little gathering uh, to the Athenian club where ex-MCS people whined and dined him and wanted to get to the truth. And I did ask him, I did ask him, I said, how did how you sort of got all this detail about British policy and so on and so forth? And he said, oh, I've got the volume, I've got, I've got the three books. So uh, he was one, one uh, unexpected customer. Uh, so that was my three, three book effort. And then I was uh, happy enough to have, have another book, The Formation of Malaysia, which is quite fat. And uh, I was, it was a great privilege to, to do so. I'll stop there for a moment. Sorry, I sort of, I didn't unmute myself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Tony. I, I think um, the, there should be an article called Chin Peng at the Athenaeum. <laughs> Some, one of us should, should write. Um, Ri Richard, can I hand over to you? Uh, Richard, you're muted still, so you just got to... Forgive me. Um, when I was asked to edit the Ghana volume, I'd spent a lot of time, of course, before in the National Archives of both the UK and of Ghana, whilst working on my thesis a long time ago. Insofar as the UK archives were concerned, my timing was spectacularly awful, in that in the year after I submitted my work, uh, my thesis, the 50-year-old rule uh, began to be re gradually replaced by the 30-year rule, um, which was tragic for me. There were now innumerable files, of course, now open to scholars, which I'd been unable to consult before. As a footnote, Ghana's old access rules, technically 50 years, were wonderfully flexible, not least because of a wonderful archivist uh, who I remember with great affection. And I'd worked pretty much without impediments on papers dealing with matters up to the 1950s. Well, I couldn't face rewriting the thesis as a book, partly because of weariness occasioned by editing the Gold Coast Blue Books and Gazettes, which I published in 1974. And actually, as a, a, something I should pay a tribute to, something that's managed to uh, allow myself and my wife out to dinner about twice a year ever since on the royalty. It's one of the very few things I've published that's actually made money. Um, the other fa fact reason why I didn't go back to that was that I had other fish to fry. So the invitation from the Badik, Badik committee uh, was basically blowing, uh, blowing on old embers the unfinished business of the old thesis, and the recognition that pretty much nobody else was spending any time on this newly available Aladdin's Cave was seductive. And the, the great secondary sources in Ghanaian history, modern Ghanaian history, works of David Apter, Dennis Austin, Emmanuel Wallerstein, none of them had bothered with the PRO, basically. Now, the 30-year dispensation opened up an enormous wealth of material I'd not previously seen it was by no means everything that should have been available. And I noted in my introduction to the first part of the Ghana volume, that at least 10% of the files listed in the PRO hand list remain closed. And there's a discussion I had with PRO staff at the time. Now, thanks to the, the forensic archeology, span which has unearthed the Hanslope hoard, we now know a great deal more about, or at least a bit more about some of those closed files whose identity we really didn't know very much about before. And this perhaps is the moment to comment on that after uh, I've not, over the last few years, been looking at the, that Ghana material released from the Hanslope collection. I have to conclude, and I think it's important for the integrity and the sense of the, the Ghana volume, that I don't think that what I've seen from Hanslope would have added much to the Bidip volume. And even more importantly, it wouldn't have altered the, the narrative thrust 
or, or my uh, analysis of the selected materials. It confirms, yes, of course, something we knew, I think, that from 1955, some intelligence files were unsurprisingly weeded, is the word that they use, and land up in, in, in Hanslow. And as evidence I'd already published indicated, some of such material had already been destroyed. And the particular nature, however, of the Hanslow material has ensured that we now have a skew, I think, in modern Ghanaian history, a skew on the role of intelligence in the larger story. Uh, thinking of the work of Christopher Andrew called a Walton, and much more re recently, the American scholar Chase Arnold. Some of the Hanslow material actually undermines some of the earlier conspiracy theories about infiltration and intrusion and importance of British and Ghanaian special branches. So that's important, that's important to note, but I don't think it rocks the, the, the general boat. Working in the PRO was a delight. I, this is a matter now, of, as I suppose, ed, ed, editor, editorial uh, biography. Um, although you don't remember those days because I think it was shut down a bit before your time, Philip. Working in the PRO was delighted with, we weren't of course official historians as you've noted, but we had considerable privileges at the early stages. The not unfrequent, uh, infrequent presence of Anne Thurston, whose understanding of the anatomy of the public record was invaluable. She invariably knew where the bodies were buried and why they were buried there. And I would add that I loved the luxury of extended opening hours. It was wonderful to be able to work for a long time there. Um, the capacity that we had of reserving files overnight and over weeks in some cases to, I, th I think the, the misery of people who wanted them who, who weren't uh, in this particular loop. Uh, access to the staff canteen, which we, when we could talk to PRO staff, uh, and our own table, which became a bit of a sort of club uh, at times. We met one another there from time to time. But once Stephen took over the editorship, we were able to, I think, alert one another through him to discoveries which he felt might impact on the work of others. And uh, to end that bit about our, our life in the PRO, Mandy Banson may be able to tell us why the Public Record Office now National Archives staff called us the monsters from Badeep. Um, I couldn't possibly comment on why we were called that. Uh, Try to reflect for the session on the results. Did the enterprise work? Well, I'm not basically a historian of empire, I'm a historian of Ghana, and I can only speak for its impact on Ghanaian historical studies. My ambition was, and it still is, that the publication of the Badeep volume would encourage Ghanaian historians, and particularly younger Ghanaian historians, to produce a matching volume on the wealth of the holdings in the National Archives. And I emphasize that at a, a small ceremony where I donated on behalf of Badeep copies to the National Archives in Ghana and to the University Library at Legon. Had that happened, the twin collections would have constituted an absolutely formidable research resource. The National Archives of Ghana are a remarkably remarkable resource and wonderful. But tragically, that hasn't happened. And there are reasons for that, and I think there are also consequences, which I'll touch upon in a moment. <coughs> Is the Ghana volume consulted? Well, I can only judge that as a result of looking at footnotes and endnotes in publications. They suggest that the answer is yes, but only occasionally. It's only really cited as a source in my experience, and all too often scholars, when they have used the Badeep material, simply cite the PRONA references, and the fact that they've done that, they've cheated in a sense by not quoting the mother source, um, either the PRO and, and indeed Badeep. It's obvious enough when the, you can see the editor's hand uh, cle clearly abbreviated documentary texts, for example, are a dead giveaway of, of that going on. The marginalization, which I think, I believe it to be, uh, is of historical import historiographical importance. The modern history of Ghana is often presented as a relatively simple and heroic struggle between nationalists and a colonial power. And even without that kind of teleology, it was a struggle whose outcome we know in terms of the all important textbooks, printed and digital learning resources of today, very little time is spent on the colonial period in terms not of whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, 
to put it in crude Bruce Gilly kind of terms, but in terms of what it did and what it looked like. There are, of course, ideological undertones at work here, which need to be mentioned and need to be acknowledged. For some scholars, Ghanaian and others, colonial records were penned with colonial bias of forethought and consequently lack not only even handedness, as do all written documents, but also they lack value in, in that kind of estimation. And beyond cherry picking, what we might regard as colonial records in Ghana have enjoyed far too little critical examination as a body of potential historical uh, information. The medium, as it were, is overwhelmed by the messages it supposedly conveys. And this criticism can be made not merely about the historiography of the period covered by Badeep, but also for periods long before that era. Consequently, I think the colonial history of institutions in Ghana, the making of the modern state of Ghana, enjoys with very few exceptions, a relatively thin literature. And Sarah can speak to that with more authority, I think, than I can. There are exceptions, of course, but not many. The records are part of the institutional history in terms of what was recorded, how it was written, and how it was stored. And I think the point that I'd like to bring out of what I felt I did and what I think the, that, this, that this series does was it brings out the changing nature of what was sent to London, what was retained in Ghana and not sent to London, and even what was statutorily destroyed. None of this was arbitrary. I know of nothing which is quite so telling, uh, quite so eloquent, as the shape of the records in Accra and Kew. It, they tell us that, for example, what diarchy, 1951 to four in Ghana actually meant, uh, what internal self-government between 54 and 56, and then 56 and 57 actually meant in terms of what departments of state did and who was, to put it very crudely, in charge of this or that department of state. You can pick that up actually out of the shape of that of the documentary record, which I think is embedded in, in Badeep. And I think Badeep should be, the, the, the series should be read in those terms. The Q holdings, to briefly, I hope I'm getting to an end soon. The Q holdings, I think, change in nature very abruptly between 51 and 54, and they change again in 1956. <coughs> the shape of the records, what goes where and who writes them, provide us, I think, with a contour map of authority and autonomy in Ghana, not only over time, but also over space. When Dick Crook kindly uh, reviewed the Ghana volume, he very sweetly said it had the pace and tension of a historical thriller. It was a sweet thing to say, but that suggests a linear narrative, whereas the record is much more like, I think, a musical concerto. It has movements, which while they have some sort of harmonic organizing principle, differ from one another considerably in form, in mood, and indeed in, on, in impact. And I learned from worrying over all of that, that Ghana's modern political history was not the satisfying but oversimplified story of a national nationalist struggle, but also the complex history of the sort that I tried to bring out in my subsequent book, Nkrumah and the Chiefs. To end, uh, regrets, uh, I have a few, as the, the famous song has it. Most notably, my inability to do more with the tea series, which I simply couldn't work out over a long period of time. To my very great uh, re relief in other work, scholars like Sally uh, uh, Stockwell, Sarah Stockwell, have filled in some of these big gaps that I left in, in the volume. And they've done so with very great authority. We know much more about the economic history of Ghana uh, than I provided uh, in, uh, very scantily provided in the Badeep volume. All in all, I think it was, a, for, for me, it was a wonderfully uh, rewarding experience. And I suppose I'm very proud of having been one of the monsters of Badeep. Uh, so there we are. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, that's a, it's a new term to me, the monsters of Badeep. I never realized I, I, I was. Well, David, um, over, over to you. Thank you and good to see you all again. And uh, thank you, Philip, for the opportunity to revisit 
former academic endeavours in the company of such good friends. I feel a bit fraudulent as a Bidip contributor because my formative years, and 1956 was the seminal year for me, took me to African history. And my PhD was in on the history of West Africa. But you can't study West Africa without engaging in one way or another with the West Indies. The two regions are closely related, notably by the 400 years of the brutal slave trade, but by 19th century African uh, American Christian missionary activity and the idea of return, and of course, Pan-African visions and idealisms. So the West Indies was in my intellectual gaze for a long time, although I'd not trodden on it and I'd not engaged with it in the archive. For me, an important event was to be offered to teach for three months as a visitor at UWI at St. Augustine's in Trinidad in the early 1990s. And as preparation, I thought I'd better prove my credentials as uh, at least knowing something about the Caribbean. And I looked around for a topic that I could explore that no one else had bothered with and lighted on something I already knew something about, which was the flu pandemic of 1918-19. And I wrote a paper on that, which I gave at the university and it was well received and subsequently published, I'm glad to say. And the months in Trinidad provided me with an opportunity to engage with West Indian scholars, to whom I'm very, very grateful, read on the region's history, and also to dig a bit deeper into the Port of Spain archives. So fired by this new interest, I agreed to work on the Bidip volume to deal with the short-lived Federation of the West Indies. I cannot now remember the sequence of events which led to this. It may be that uh, no one else wanted to do the job and they said there's a gap and it needs to be filled. Killen Gray, you're the man who might do it, um, which I suppose is a, a, a sort of accolade of a sort, but not one that I necessarily wanted. However, it was a relief that Steve Ashton, wise in the ways of Bedeep, was to be a companion and guide in this venture. And 18 months in the National Archives reading and selecting docu documents was a wonderful education. Uh, the limits of the volume are of course set out early in our introduction. And it's a narrow constraint that I suppose is true to all the volumes to a certain degree, where you provide an analysis of metropolitan policies as they sought to loosen grip on an empire and yet maintain some element of influence. And I suppose it's not the way that many of us would approach anything that we would write on historically. We would want to see the other side so there was a, a balance between the metropole and the local. Um, but there we are. An abiding recollection of the CO papers for that period in, in, in the National Archives is that fast, amongst all the fascinating accounts of high and low policies were the mountains of official correspondence uh, concerned with post-service employment and pensions for European officers. No one, as far as I know, has bothered, I was almost going to say waste their time trying to make head or tail of that sort of mass of stuff, which was part of the uh, uh, detritus on the end of empire. I very much, very much echo Richard's um, eulogy on the old PRO, which is where I started. Um, I remember sharing a table, I think, with Brian Willen, um, as he was looking at South Africa and I was looking at Ghana. And you could then have piles of documents for the week. And so CO96 came out and there I would have 20 volumes on each side of me. And that was my week's work. And you came in and, as Richard said, you had those long hours. Also, I go with Tony's um, comments on the freedom of uh, accessibility to areas of the National Archives out at Kew that you didn't normally get access to, including, of course, cheap lunches. Um, well, the West Indies volume was published in 1999, but I've rarely seen it referred to, although I suspect, as Richard says, uh, people will quote the document um, from 
that source, but not having looked at the original. Now, why is it not referred to? There may be several possible reasons. Perhaps it wasn't a very good or useful book, something which one must always ask as an author. Um, or that the volume said all that was necessary to say on Federation. There was no more to be said. <clears throat> I've not come across much that has been written on aspects of the Federation. Nothing, as far as I know, on the Federation as a whole. <clears throat> and after all, the history of a failed venture, which lasted four years and interrupted the process of national territorial independence, perhaps was thought by many scholars to be marginal to the subsequent histories of new nation states after 1962. Chapter four in the collection is on the breakup of the Federation and independence for Jamaica and Trinidad. And <clears throat> if anything, that set me thinking about uh, the question of independence for small territories, which I did a bit of work on and had something published. But also chapter four deals with the presence of West Indians in the UK. And so it relates to some of the things that I've been working on more recently. It may be that federalism was not a very gripping topic. And indeed, it could indeed, it could indeed be dull business of trying to forge a new nation, which was not a very attractive proposition to many of the people to whom it was being attempted to be sold. Now, I've not looked at the history curriculum of the various campuses of the University of the West Indies, so I can't comment on the significance given to the brief years of federation. I would be very interested actually to see that, and um, perhaps I ought to fill that gap. And as for scholars looking for a research topic on the West Indies, there are so many more exciting aspects awaiting study on slavery and emancipation or on the social, economic, political and cultural history of the many territories of the region. And you think of the books that I've got on my shelves on Jamaica, uh, particularly on the social and cultural history, to make it uh, to persuade me that were I a scholar, I wouldn't be heading for the rather dull uh, uplands of federation and British government policy. I'd be looking more closely at what was going on in Kingston itself and in Port of Spain and Port Antonio and Montego Bay and on the fields and farms of Jamaica. I began on a personal note and let me end on one because the investment of time and intellectual energy in writing and editing the, B, the deep volume had fairly rich rewards. In my final three years of teaching, I taught a special course on the Caribbean using documents in the Badeep volume. And conveniently, I met with students in uh, Michael Twaddle's room in the ICS. Um, Michael kindly said, well, that's a central, central and sensible place for it to the benefit of students. And so that's where we met. In retirement, I've continued to research and write on aspects of Caribbean history, on the independence of smaller territories. And for several years, I organized at the ICS an annual conference on the UK overseas territories. But my major interest has been largely on the Black Atlantic diaspora. And in that respect, and particularly writing a biography of Harold Moody and the League of Colored Peoples, a Jamaican in London, I've looked at both the metropolitan, but also the Caribbean dimensions of that, but by going backward, not using the Badeep documents, but preceding them. That doesn't mean to say that I've not used the Badeep volumes and they do remain close to hand and in writing about the 1940s and the 1930s as well, I found invaluable the collection of documents that Steve and um, Sarah have put together, but also the volumes on Nigeria and your volumes, uh, Philip, on Central Africa. I'm only sorry that the East African volumes are not there. No one's mentioned those so far. I just squeezed that in as a regret. There are regrets, of course. Um, regret, I suppose, is that the volume for the West Indies started at 1948. Um, it could have started earlier and I'm more knowledgeable and wiser now and could have gone back a bit earlier. 
I would have liked to have had more on local politics and the remarkable players who were involved at the local level, people like Norma Menley and Bustamante, and of course the formidable Eric Williams in Trinidad. In the process of collecting documents that might have been included, I amassed a large pile of paper, which for a long time resided in my overflow bookstore at the end of the garden. Unfortunately, I disposed of it because um, I had nothing to do with it and I couldn't find anywhere to locate it. So if you would have liked that, I'm sorry that I didn't contact you and say it's here, come and collect it with a, a, a three-way loader. But um, it was a, a, an enriching experience to work on the volume and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. And it's been a great aid, the volumes to my current writing. So thank you all of you for your contributions in that way. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, David. Uh, and I, um, uh, I might ask um, audience members, again, if you have questions that you'd like me to feed into the discussion, please use the, the chat function. Uh, Brian Tutts already uh, uh, said something here, which I'll, I'll pick up on about the East Africa volumes in a minute. But, but yeah, please, please do use chat to ask questions. So um, Mandy, uh, Mandy Banton, turning to you. Uh, Mandy's going to join us via audio uh, and say a little bit about your uh, your role from the National Archives perspective overseeing this project. Mandy. Mandy, you're muted. Do you, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Sorry about that. That's I kept I kept hitting unmute and it again, it's refused like... to uh, cooperate. <sighs> The, 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 the drawback of the past is that um, almost certainly going to be repeating some things uh, said already, but um, hopefully there won't be too much duplication. When, when I was asked to contribute to this event, my first thought was that Badeep seemed to be a constant throughout my 25 year career at the National Archives. I was nearly right. The project started in 1987, my third year at the Public Record Office, as it then was, and the last two country volumes were published in 2006. So about 20 of my 25 years. I was the main liaison point with the Badeep editors and at some stage became a member of the project committee. As well as the rewarding discussions about sources, there was a good deal of the mundane the, the minor problems with document production and copying. And although they were minor, they sometimes resulted in heating discuss heated discussions with some of my colleagues in those, with those responsibilities. I had genuinely not heard about the monsters from Badeep, but I do wonder if it was <laughs> colleagues in those departments who, who, who came up with that description. A rather different aspect that sticks in my mind is an ongoing problem with the stationery office, the publisher. There seemed little interest in marketing the expensive hardback volumes, so their availability now online is wonderful. In the last few days, I carefully adjust two volumes. The general volume on the Conservative government from 1957 to 64, and the country volume on Nigeria, in an attempt to remind myself of the strengths and weaknesses of the sources used. The editors of the first spell out problems in selection, pointing to the huge number of documents created by relevant British government departments, their reliance on the sketchy archival listings and the knowledge that material remained closed or retained. And there is virtually no information about the many documents that were destroyed in the creating departments rather than being deposited at Kew. In the years since those two volumes were published, the general volume in 2000 and the Nigeria volume in 2001, there have been numerous developments in archival practice and it might be hoped that documents at TNA relating to decolonization 
would now be more easily identified. But although the paper listings used by Badeep editors are now available online, in most cases, document descriptions remain inadequate and almost none of the documents have been digitized. So, for example, the Nigeria volume comprises 549 documents. The vast majority come from records of the Colonial Office, with a minority coming from the Cabinet, the Commonwealth Relations Office, the Foreign Office and the Prime Minister's Office. Of that total, only three are now for download via TNA's catalogue. All three come from a series of cabinet memoranda digitised by TNA with external funding. One other paper in the Nigeria volume is available through a subscription service provided by the digital publisher Adam Matthew. I mentioned the often inadequate descriptions in TNA's catalogue. So, for example, the Nigeria volume includes a Foreign Office paper from a file described in that catalogue merely as Political Relations UK under the subheading Africa, Nigeria. <coughs> the volume editor, the late Martin Lynn, provided a general description for the file as Macmillan's visit to Nigeria and describes the first item on that file as Foreign Office record of a conversation between the UK and Nigerian Prime Minister at Lagos on January 1960. So that was part of Harold Macmillan's tour of Africa, best known for his wind of change speech in Cape Town the following month. Another example. In November 1949, a strike at a coal mine in Enugu resulted in the shooting dead of 21 miners and the injuring of 30 more. The shootings led to widespread riot rioting in eastern Nigeria. Yes, the establishment of a national emergency and eventually a commission of inquiry. None of this could be known from TNA's catalogue. Lynn produces 15 papers from four colonial office files and provides a synopsis. None of the TNA catalogue descriptions gives a paper, a picture of what actually happened, referring merely to coal disputes, which could mean anything. The setting up of a committee of inquiry and reactions to the commission report. So what I want to emphasise now is the huge ongoing utility of the Badeep volumes to anyone concerned with the decolonisation process. Not only do they provide information about the content of files, which is not otherwise readily available, but they include scholarly introductions providing invaluable discussion of UK government deliberations on both a general and a country specific level. They provide the text of literally thousands of documents, which the researcher might otherwise find it impossible to identify. Editorial content also includes chronologies lists of office holders, abbreviations. Where no country volume has been compiled, the general volumes do provide much information about individual territories. As noted, a good deal of material was closed or retained when the Badeep, Badeep volumes were together. The editors had no privileged access, but could see only documents available to the general public. Although it's a tedious task, it is now possible to search the TNA catalogue for items released more recently. As others have said, a new release is the collection of so-called Foreign and Commonwealth Office migrated archives taken from the former dependencies and released to TNA in 2012-2013, long after completion of the Badeep project. These two are not well catalogued and not digitised. It's difficult to, to know what they might add to previous knowledge, but anyone working on decolonisation now would certainly want to look at the Migrated Archive series in FCO 141. The collection for Nigeria is comparatively small, just 399 items for the period 
1943 to 60, covered by Bedeen. Many are clearly irrelevant, but 86 do relate specifically to the constitutional conferences and related matters. Whether these include material not already re represented in the British government records can, of course, only be ascertained by a careful examination. In addition, after admitting their holding of the migrated archives, the FCO produced a spreadsheet, which is available online, of all the documentation they were holding, contrary to the requirements of the public records legislation. Many of these were FCO files simply a few years late in being processed for transfer to TNA. But a huge number, estimated then at about 600,000, came from the FCO's predecessor bodies, such as the Colonial Office and the Commonwealth Relations Office. In theory, at least, there may be relevant material in those collections. And I'd like to finish by picking up on Richard's comment about treasury records. Um, it's always been a great sadness to me that there is no guide to the records of the treasury held at TNA. They are so important. They touch absolutely every aspect of domestic, colonial and, and, and foreign life. It's, it's one of those situations where uh, members of staff with considerable knowledge have been allowed to leave or retire without committing their experience to papers, to a paper. I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mandy. Um, let me just say two, two things uh, quickly. Again, please use chat to uh, pose questions to the panel. Secondly, if the panelists themselves would like to come back uh, on any of the points that have been raised in subsequent contributions, um, please sort of raise your, your hands, either a, a digital or a, a real hand. And in, in the meantime, I'm just going to use um, my prerogative as chair uh, just to, to say one or two things about my own volume, about the Central Africa volume, which was published in 2005. Um, Firstly, um, we tend, I think, as, as historians, as humanities scholars, it's like to fetishize the work of the individual scholar. And we often complain about being pushed into this sort of science model of, of joint research projects, big, generously funded research projects. But actually, working on Be Deep, for me, and I'm, I'm sure for, for the other speakers it was just a fantastic experience. Um, it really helped to build my career. I was just a relatively junior scholar. Um, when I joined the history department at the University of Reading, um, one of the first courses I put on was a comparative, uh, special subject, comparative history of decolonization in Malaya and Ghana using Tony and Richard's volumes as the, as the main primary source. And so I, I can't remember when the letter came, sort of in probably around 2000, 2001, uh, from Andrew Porter asking me to join as an editor. I was absolutely thrilled. Um, and it, it was wonderful working in such a supportive collegial environment with such wonderful scholars and again, it's just that the kind of the, the care and attention that went into those volumes, the sort of care and attention one can only really guarantee through a collective, a collective effort with lots of different pairs of eyes looking at it. Um, it was, the work was done uh, probably between about 2001, 2004, and I sent the proofs to Steve Ashton uh, uh, at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies in July. And I phoned, and I know it's July because I phoned him up, it was the 7th of July, to check that he'd got the proofs. And he said, yeah, I've got the proofs, but something's happening outside. Um, it was the, the Russell Square bombing. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I remember, 
remember the date, and uh, it came out in November 2005. Um, uh, in time for the, uh, the 40th anniversary of Rhodesian UDI, which is where the, the volumes finish. In a way, the again, it, it tells you something about the kind of the the the, the sort of slightly warped chronologies that we we use. My volume was on the three Central African territories of uh, Malawi, Zambia, and Z Zimbabwe now, uh, Nyasaland, Northern and Southern Rhodesia, um, and the. Uh, 1965 seemed like the obvious point to end um, because one was dealing with three separate territories and after 1965 it was only really Rhodesia that that commanded major cabinet level attention um, but but again the two volumes break not in the middle of that period, but in 1958, which again seemed to be a kind of a logical point when from having been a, a backwater in terms of British government policy, when things seemed to be going fairly well. Uh, one had the Nyasaland emergency, beginning of 59, and the, the, the very uh, sudden um, increase in the pace of decolonization in, in Central Africa. Uh, and so that, that made perfect sense. Some of the, you know, Mandy was talking about the cryptic uh, referencing some of the, the, uh, the less than fully self-explanatory labeling in the National Archives catalog. That could be a bit of a, uh, it could lead to interesting things. I became fascinated by this is heading demise of the crown, um, which of course was a rather kind of uh, pompous way of talking about the death of, the possible death of the queen. What happens if the queen dies? What do we do? And that, that led on to my next book, which was on the monarchy and the end of empire. So again, it's, it's interesting the way that one, one project leads to another. Um, it was an interesting time to be working because um, it followed the 1993 major government white paper on open government, which had what what's, has always seemed to me the most sensible kind of settlement with historians, which was really to say, this isn't a Freedom of Information Act, but we know we've held back too much material you know it. So you tell us what you'd like to see. And if we don't think the sky will fall in, we will probably let you see it. And so I kind of having the, 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 um, the luxury of time on my side, I was able just to put in requests for anything that looked as though it might be significant, but which, which was closed. And I put in requests for the opening of around 50 documents. And the vast majority, I think about 36, I was allowed to see in, in their entirety. Six in a redacted form and six that were, were kept back. But those were the sort of lollipops. You know, well, again, we were talking about not having privileged access, but, but having privileges. So I was able to sit in the map room upstairs from the main reading room and order you know, 20 boxes at a time. And often that was, you know, that was hard, hard slog, but they, you know, there would be these occasional lollipops of files that had been released uh, before their time and having no idea what they contained. Most of them contained complete trivia, you know, some silly patronage that the Duke of Edinburgh had in, in Southern Rhodesia. Um, and, and so I don't think, again, very, very little of it would, would sort of change the way one, one would have written. Um, I did include some material from the Walensky papers uh, from, from Oxford, uh, dealing with intelligence related material, which I thought was probably duplicated in closed form. 
uh, in files that the, the National Archives had access to. And, and a couple of documents from the Goral Barnes papers in Churchill College. Um, again, the main, the main change since that time when I was sort of working on Central Africa was that, that subsequently MI5 started to release files. And I, you know, for, for some of the nationalist leaders, particularly the very peripatetic ones like Hastings Banda, um, those MI5 files are tremendously interesting and revealing. Um, people like Banda, people like Cohen, no, not Cohen, because Cohen is still alive, Michael Scott, um, another person. And you, you are able, through those files, not just to piece together um, really quite intimate details of the life of those people, but also get a sense of how the intelligence networks worked in terms of gathering and sharing information. Um, I think that the, the BD, I mean, the, um, the Hanslow Park files are something a little bit different. They, they really illuminate the world seen from the Governor General's office, which one didn't get uh, from the, uh, the Q files in the same way. Um, but that doesn't mean that I think we were, we were hoodwinked or in some sense simply passive consumers in a history supermarket in queue. I think the editors knew the limitations of the sources. I think we pushed at the boundaries. And I think it's a shame that when the Hanslow Park papers were released, you know, there were some comments made in the press which suggested that we should simply kind of tear up everything that we'd, we'd produced up until that point uh, because we'd been hoodwinked by British government secrecy. I don't, I don't think we have. And I think we've now, after a few years on, reached a much more nuanced appreciation of what those Hanslow Park files do and don't reveal. I do think finally, and this sort of comes back to the one of the questions in the in the chat. Um, I think it's a shame, given the increased focus now on colonial violence, that two case studies were that, that were uh, earmarked for volumes in the Big Deep series, i.e., Kenya and Cyprus. Those volumes were never produced, um, and I think that that in a sense would have helped to answer the case because actually in the case of in the case of Kenya certainly Kenya I know probably better than the Cyprus files um, there was already a huge amount of material there about violence about abuses about the detention camps about torture um, uh, and if those had come out in, a, in one of the, the, the sort of conventional BD volumes, I think it would have been very revealing. In a sense, it's almost more shocking that what the government was prepared to wave through uh, rather than the things they, were, they wanted to conceal, which were often, as I said, rather trivial things. Um, so um, that I think is a, is a matter of regret. And it, it wasn't because the Be Deep series didn't want volumes on those, on those uh, territories. They did, they just for various editorial reasons never appeared and, and probably never will. So that, that's some, uh, those are sort of some comments from, from Central Africa. Um, let me go into the chat now um brian i hope i hope that's i don't i don't think there were ever there was ever going to be a volume for uganda or tanzania i don't think that that was on the on the schedule but kenya kenya was um and it just they, it was just never completed um so there's a there's a question um from Nicholas Watts about the, the sort of the science side. You said that yes. 
can say stop or comment further on her regret there was not more on environments and science um thank you for that and actually just before i come to that i wanted to say something about kenya hmm. um i obviously can't speak for the editors of the other general volumes but it's my recollection and this is going back over 25 years, so my memory may be hazy, mm. but we were um, sort of one of the guidelines for us were to avoid potential areas of duplication. So to um, leave out uh, extensive or, or much on countries that were going to be featured in series B as country mm. volumes. And at that stage, Kenya was going to be um, in series uh, B. Um, so um, just a reflection on, on that. Um, Nicholas, thank you for the, uh, the question. Um, so I said I regret it because in an ideal world where one could cover uh, a whole spectrum, um, it's something that uh, I would, um, you know, looking back, I can see is uh, potentially missing or an area where there might have been uh, more that could or something that could be said and that we haven't really um, addressed. Um, and I say that because of how uh, fantastically interesting so much of the literature is that has emerged on on this area since. But obviously there was some work uh, at that point on environment um, and empire. Um, but I think it's a question of the choices that were made and the areas that we chose to focus on. And perhaps, uh, as I said in my comments, you know, focus more on the Second World War than the interwar period. But also this attempt to try and um, within this very, very broad uh, scope and, and the range that we had to cover, try and present uh, semi-coherent stories. And in the... Um, uh, sort of economics and social sections, uh, there were particular themes that presented themselves as obvious one. Um, the most obvious was uh, evolving policy in relation to colonial development. And obviously that was prominent in the historiography. But I suppose some of the other things we picked up on reflected my own interests. Um, so uh, finance, uh, industrialization, colonial industrialization. Um, and then in the social policy section, uh, there's, there are documents on nutrition, on colonial housing, on colonial medicine, um, on colonial labour, and particularly on colonial education. And yes, those, those do relate to um, science, but not so much environment. Um, and I guess it was a case of not being able to include everything. But, you know, looking back, uh, were I doing it again, I would say that perhaps there should have been more on, on that particular area. I don't know if that really answers the question, yeah. but that's, that's a sort of honest response. Thank you very much. Um, Tony, can I, can I just sort of, just following up on this, this point that I ended on about, you know, this renewed interest on violence, on colonial violence, on the, the suggestion that uh, end of empire has been sort of whitewashed in terms of being presented as a as a largely peaceful affair. I mean, Malaya is clearly a case in which extreme violence was used. Um, it was a major counterinsurgency campaign. Um, do you feel that the you know the the materials that you had access to in the National Archives at the time you were working on that? Is there any sense that uh, abuses were still being covered up then? Um, what did you feel about the kind of the balance of the of the material, sort of showing what it was like at the at the sharp end on the ground when you were putting that volume together? Um, would you go about it differently now? I think I probably would. Um, I mean, the, the, the particular atrocity that always stands out in Malaya is uh, the atroc atrocity in which um, in the early months of the emergency in December 1948, uh, soldiers moved into the uh, village of Tanjong Malim, uh, stayed the night, and in the morning 
massacred the 12 adult males who were in the village. And that was covered up at the time. And it was covered up, it broke into the public arena, I suppose, after uh, my lie in South Vietnam, when the people, uh, the Sunday People magazine said, had a big spread uh, mm -hmm. with, the, with the title, we have our My Lies too. And this opened up a great deal of debate and there was inquiry and the only file I have uh, found was a file uh, which um, was a, a request um, made to the, I think actually it was made to the Foreign Office for more uh, material and they called up the paperwork, which was not at that point um, at Hanslow Park, of course, but at um, was it North London, where the, this, 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 uh, I forget exactly where they housed it. And the response was, um, we can find nothing but this is the way of all such questions uh, on, the, on the emergency at the moment. So there was the cover up going on then, but it's this Batang Kali incident, which is always the one that comes up uh, in the emergency. And again, um, I suppose the, the, the treatment of the, uh, the, 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 the populace, the, 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 the villages that uh, were created with uh, barbed wire around so that the, uh, the, 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 the villagers could not, um, well, could they survive in peace or so the villagers could not sustain the guerrilla force on the edges of the, of, of the jungle. This, this is, this is, this is um, material that comes up, but it's the, it's the Tanjong Malin case that is, is always coming up um, on a very regular basis. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I mean, just uh, again on materials that might have been uh, released since then. I mean, Rich, Richard, have you looked at any of the? I, I'm not. I'm not familiar with the Hanslake Park material on Ghana. How much there was, or whether it was, it was very revealing. Have you Have you been able to revisit any of that? Yes, I have. I've certainly looked at quite a lot of it. Yeah. And uh, quite a lot of people have made a, a minor career out of uh, it, it's um, the, the, the releases. Mm. I, I, they, the, the stuff confirms, in many senses, I think leads that are already in the Badeep volume, but are out there, out there anyhow, which is an extremely divided colonial state mm. uh, at the end where the Foreign and Commonwealth Office is at the, the throat of the colonial office. The awful relationship between uh, political authority in Westminster and uh, the governor's office in, in Ghana, all of that comes out. But it says nothing, the, the, the Hanslope material says nothing new. Uh, there are no revelations other than confirming my long held, more than suspicion, I mean, I've published on, on this, the, the incredible ineptness of uh, the supposed <laughs> very, very powerful, almost sort of um, comes out of a sort of uh, a Marvel comic, uh, this all-purpose all brilliant uh, um, intelligence service that was on top of everything. The kind of thing that comes out of, I think, called the Walton's book, uh, which just isn't there. I mean, a lot of it is quite clownish and silly. And actually reading it makes me angry, not because it did terrible, horrible things, but because there's such classes. Uh, you don't want to smack heads. <laughs> uh, and the, what is apparent in all of that is the incredible racism of the intelligence services and the fact that the FCO uh, really falls, is pleased by that kind of material and pl puffs it up no end in a, a Daily telegraph -y kind of way. Horrid. Sarah, did you want to come in on this, on this question of Handlight Park? I had a question to Richard. Unfortunately, my copies of your volumes, Richard, are locked in my office in um, central London. Although I should obviously have looked at the, the digital versions, but I wondered whether um, the material that's in the FCO 141 around the plebiscite over uh, Togoland is um, actually tells a story that, that wasn't as readily available before the release of the Hanslope Park material or, or whether that's not the case. 
I think it is pretty readily available because a lot of it's in in, in Paul Nugent's work. Mm -hmm. um, it really would be, I, I, don't, I don't think it bears republication. I don't think there's a great deal more to be said. It's been it's been looked over since so not by me, and I think that actually the the whole relationship with the mandated territory is a, a, a thin bit of my volume. I wish I had done more on that. Uh, I found that difficult, uh, to be honest. And I also had young whippersnappers like Nugent <laughs> getting at it already. Uh, and it's, an, it's a rather neglected thing. That I can't remember how many documents there are on the Togo plebiscite and, and the result. There's, there's much more to be said there. I think you're right. I think that that is an area that uh, is well worth following up. But as I say, a lot of, a lot of it's out there already. Thank you, Richard. Do we learn anything more about the governments, the relations, the local governments' relations with Nkuma from the from the Hanslow papers? Because I, I mean, we've, we've got the strong impression from your volume that um, actually one of the one of the reasons the British, you know, didn't favour fairly prolonged transfers of power after Ghana is that they'd seen what happened in Ghana. That that you know, there comes a point in the, in the mid fifties when the, the government is having, there are, there are sort of scandals bubbling under over Nkrumah and the CPP uh, party, which in a sense, the, the British are having to kind of defend in the peculiar position of having to defend Nkrumah from this and keep the show on the road. Um, is, there, is there any, any kind of new revelations of, at that level the detail is there. There is, of course, the the, the, the famous the famous story about Incruma, the, the uh, illicit diamond buyer and seller, um, and of course, it is a a, a a bit of information that the governor's office has over Incruma, except it doesn't seem to use it. Mm. Uh, the the notion of deceit and so on that haunts quite a lot of the. Um, conspiracy theory stuff, really doesn't seem to emerge as part of the, the politics. I think there was a general understanding that keeping the show on the road was, was pretty important. And then, of course, things blow up both in London and in Accra. The emergence of the National Liberation Movement is a very significant moment, which looks as though it is going to tear the country apart. And then, of course, we've got Suez. Uh, and the complete mobilization of every heart and mind in w w Whitehall on that major matter. And everybody there seems to run away from the implications of all sorts of things. As a result of that, it does, you can actually feel a, a quietening of interest uh, and the, the hell with it kind of uh, mood. Um, but I, I, there, there, there's a. There's a yeah, not all that much on on in Kruma. and and the illicit diamond buying thing. I think is ambiguous. I don't mm. quite quite know quite know how to to, to to pin that down. Whether his his own defence of what was going on is plausible or not, um, I've never heard it mentioned in Ghana. Interestingly, mm. right. it wasn't widely known. David, ha has there been anything? released since the your volume on the West Indies came out that you you wish you'd been able to include or or again would you would you approach the the whole enterprise differently if you were coming at it now the answer to that is I don't know mm. because I have not worked on that period I've not gone back to it mm. it, it it's it's like a lot of the things that you do as an academic. You you work on something, you say, okay, well, I've done that. And if you have a, a bit of a butterfly mind like mine, you look on, or perhaps the sort of docile sheep, you're looking around for the next bit of delicious grazing and uh, what you can work on that would excite you. Um, so I, the answer is, I don't know. Um, because what I've worked on since is, is going back to the the 30s and the 40s and in a way that's a much more exciting period for the Caribbean. The Caribbean, I was thinking about it just now when you were talking about violence in Malaya and disputes in Ghana and Kenya and Central Africa, um, uh, things that I remember from having lived through them or at least I remember bits of them 
But the West Indies, you know, this once great and important part of the British Empire in the 18th century, um, source of great wealth and corruption. And yet by the 1950s, it's, it's you know, long been a slum of empire. And it's almost an embarrassment. You don't want the Americans to have it. And perhaps that would have been another important area that we could have developed, looked more at uh, United States policy in relation to Britain and the Caribbean. Um, with, um, because that's there, and, it, and we do in part because Chagaramas and, and the mm. um, dispute over the bases and so on, um, and how Britain is mediating between American interests and um, indigenous interests in places like Trinidad and, and some of the other islands, Antigua and um, St. Lucia and Jamaica. But um, I, 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 I said originally, I thought it was a rye. One could perhaps regard it as a rather dull topic to work on. Um, I don't think I found it dull. I found it quite interesting, um, but not interesting enough to return to it or linger too long with it afterwards. <laughs> well, that's very <laughs> admirable, I think. Um, oh, d there don't seem to be any more questions in the chat, and we've gone on for um, for, for for ninety minutes. So. Um, Please, I, I think one of the reasons that we arranged this was to try and boost the use of those volumes. Um, and um, I'm very pleased, as I said, that, that um, David Goldsworthy's volumes are now up there. I think that when we, when we originally put them online, um, connections seem to be a little bit slower. They seem to take an awfully long time to to download, which is maybe why I didn't sort of shout their existence from the roofs um, straight away, because I wondered whether there was a better way of actually of actually organizing them and digitizing them. Um, but I hope that they will be used more because they're such a wonderful resource. And, you know, if you think that the the way that we've put them online uh, is, is a little bit clunky, well, just think back to the way we were actually working as BD editors. We, we still had our notes on little um, cards, card index cards, with the notes written in, in longhand. I think that was a Ronald Hyam uh, sort of innovation. It was very low tech. So in a sense, we have we have moved on a little bit in, in BD. And... Um, I hope the fact that they are digitized will mean that they're used more. But thank you all so much to our panelists, Sarah, Tony, Richard, uh, David, and, and, and Mandy. It's been a wonderful discussion, uh, brought back many memories for me. And thank you all very much for, for joining us. Thank you all.